Hi everyone, Adam from Meadows Panel Builders, and today we're going to talk about aircraft performance and flight testing. During phase one flight testing, it's important to verify your aircraft's performance numbers against the POH numbers from the manufacturer to verify that not only did you build your aircraft correctly, but also that your engine is performing as expected, and also to verify any modifications that you may have made to the airframe or to the power plant that their effect is known. One example of that is there's a lot of different propeller options that people are using. Uh, so for example, in a Sling TSI, we have actually also a different power plant, so we can do the 915 or 916 engine now. And then Duke has two different propellers that you can do. You can do the Airmaster propeller if you're on the 915, and then you can also do the MT propeller on both engines. So your propeller choice is going to make a difference, and of course, between the 915 and 916, that's going to make a huge difference in climb, at least for the first five minutes. So we're going to be talking about true airspeed, VX, VY, and VG in this video. The true airspeed tests are important to verify that your static installation is correct, that your pitot installation is correct as well to some degree. Of course, most airplanes have that standardized and they're usually pretty good, but static is one that can sometimes be less of a known quantity. So when we talk about static systems, when you look at what the big guys do, the jets and stuff like that, uh, you'll notice a lot of the flight testing aircraft actually have a long barbershop pole looking thing hanging off the uh, tail of the aircraft with a little cone on it which is called a drogue and that is the static port for the aircraft so what they do is they throw that out there and when they're flying that static port is completely unaffected by the aircraft's aerodynamics so turbulence or low pressure zones or anything like that coming off the fuselage or the wings or the tail that's not going to affect it and that's why they do that then what they do is with that known quantity, they will test the different static location ports on the aircraft to determine which one is the most accurate across the entire airspeed range of that airplane. Of course, there's a lot of calculations and perhaps even wind tunnel testing that goes into it up to that point, but that's the final verification. In the kit plane world, or even in some of the other smaller certified manufacturers, we don't necessarily have that luxury, you know, there's there's not this budget like these big guys have to produce these aircraft. So they have different ways of doing it. And in the kit plane world, specifically if you're doing scratch built, that test may have never been completed by the, the kit manufacturer, the plans manufacturer to begin with. Uh, in other cases, things change. So in the case of the Sling TSI, there's been three different static port locations uh, throughout the life cycle of the aircraft. And currently the latest one is just forward of the NACA ducts that provide fresh air to the cabin uh, on the forward end of the fuselage just a little bit after the firewall. Uh, that location, they have flush static ports and then they have a fence that goes around it uh, that has a step in it to help uh, disrupt airflow away from the static port so that it's getting as clean air as possible. Uh, so that static port location is what we have on our Sling TSI 915 Mike Whiskey and that is what we did these tests off of. And as I come to find out, when we look at these numbers and then we compare against other aircraft, um, there was actually a pretty significant difference. The POH for the TSI was written with the original static port location in mind and to my knowledge has not been updated uh, since then. And so that is what we wanted to do. We wanted to make sure that our POH numbers were accurate as much as possible. So let's talk about how we do that test. So as far as actually flying this test goes, what you want to do is you want to first make sure that you know how to pull the data logs off of your equipment in the aircraft. I'm assuming at this point that you have an EFIS in your airplane. Uh, any EFIS system, whether it be Garmin, Dynon, MGL, GRT, they all have a way to data log at least in some capacity um, and be able to download them off the screen. In most cases, you just leave an SD card in the screen um, and then you take that with you and you pull it into your computer and pull the data off of it. Uh, in our case, we have our IntelliKey NG system, which has recording on it uh, in our aircraft. And so we were able to download logs from that over Wi-Fi instead of having to take an SD card with us. And that data came from the G3X. So it's all the numbers that we were seeing on the screen. So what we did is we flew four cardinal tracks. So we were tracking 
360, 90, 180, 270 over the ground, not heading. And uh, what I did is I established a constant airspeed. And then after everything stabilized, airspeed, altitude, all those things, I started a one minute timer and flew in that direction for that minute. I did that in four directions. And with the formulas I'm gonna show you, you only need three directions, but I did four just in case one of them uh, didn't end up turning out so well for some reason, like if there was an issue maintaining airspeed. Another thing I did is I did this at 130 knots, and then I also did it at 80 knots. And the reason for that is because I wanted to check the usable range of the airspeed indicator, or most of it anyways, to see what those numbers would, would be at the high and low end, make sure that it was accurate in both spots. Because sometimes, as a matter of fact, in the old static port location, what we ended up finding out is that at low speeds, you were reading 10 knots too slow, but at higher speeds, you were reading 10 knots too fast. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to figure out what that error would be across the whole range. A couple other things we did for this test, the aircraft was loaded in max gross weight, and also we flew this one at 6,500 feet, and the reason for that was simply because that was an altitude that gave us the smoothest air possible. You don't wanna be doing this test on a day where you're in a lot of turbulence, whether it be from wind or thermals or what have you, because turbulence is going to affect your result. It's gonna vary your airspeed when you're trying to maintain a constant airspeed. It could be messing with your altitude a little bit. And so we wanted to make sure that we had none of that. So 6,500 feet is what worked for us at that time. So let's take that data now that I have pulled up on my computer here. Let's go through it in Excel. Let me show you what that looks like, at least from the G3X Touch. And then let me show you what my Excel spreadsheet looks like that I used off of that uh, document that I mentioned out in link in the description and show you how to get the numbers that you're looking for. Okay, so here we are in our CSV file. This came directly off of the uh, G3X system. And you can see that uh, we've got a few header rows at the top that uh, have labels for all of the columns of data. And one thing that you can do in Excel is you can actually freeze these header rows because right now you see if I scroll down, they disappear. Uh, so if you want to freeze them in place, click on the fourth row. So the first row of data, go up to view at the top here and hit freeze panes. Now you can see that the header rows are frozen in place and now you can see the labels regardless of where you're at in the file. One thing I did on this file is I highlighted in yellow what uh, where, where we were doing our test just to make it easier to come back to this knowing that I was going to record a video on it. Um, so let's take a look at some of the information here. We can see that we were in fact at a barometric altitude of 6,500 feet. Uh, we were roughly 130 knots indicated. This I was just coming up to speed. Here is the true airspeed that the G3X says we flew, which is as important because we can use this to compare against when we get our number out of the calculator sheet. Uh, looking further, we've got, uh, there's all kinds of data here actually, but uh, for now we're just gonna look at uh, these two columns. Actually also here is our GPS ground speed and track. So ground speed, track, indicated airspeed, and true airspeed, those are the ones that we're really concerned with right now. So we can see here that right around this point, we we're basically as stable on 130 knots as it can get. And at the time we were tracking 262, 263 over the ground, and our ground speed was somewhere in the neighborhood of 121 to 122. Now, one item of importance, at least on the G3X data log, is this data log takes out the magnetic variation and compensation from the ground tracks. So I actually had 270 set on the autopilot when we were flying this, but we sit at roughly seven and a half to eight degrees of declination. So the sheet here is gonna show 262 for 270. So when you're doing this test, bear that in mind. That's why it doesn't make sense. However, as long as you type these numbers in as they're shown to you, it'll be fine uh, because the vector triangles don't care about magnetic declination. They just care that you're putting accurate information in. So with this pretty stable airspeed, we'll pick kind of right here where it says exactly 130. Our ground speed is 121 and our ground track was 262. So I'm gonna pull up the calculator here and ground track was 262. And I gotta go back to the ground speed number 121. So 121 speed, 262 track. 
So now we'll go back to our Excel file here and we will find the next GPS track. So here we are stable at 172 on track and our ground speed was 146. And you can see that the indicated airspeed here was a pretty steady 130. So 172, 146. 146 speed, 172 track. Okay, now let's go to our last one. So we turned to 90 degrees of, uh, of track here. And let's find a spot where we were pretty stable at 130 right there. So our track was 82, our speed was 171. 171 and 82. Okay, so what happened here is all of these numbers started filling in. So these numbers, the X and Ys, are going to be a part of the vector triangle calculation. You can see here that it also gave us our wind speed and direction. So wind direction was 266, wind speed was 25 knots. Our true air speed as calculated is 146 knots. So what we can do is go back here and we can see that our true air speed was 146 knots. And it jumps around a little bit 145 to 147, but we're basically centered on exactly what the spreadsheet said we should be. So this static port location, at least at 130 knots of indicated airspeed, is essentially perfect. Uh, we also did this test, like I said, at 80 knots. Um, I'm not going to go through all this again, but what I will tell you is that at 80 knots, uh, we were reading two knots too fast in the airplane versus what the calculator said. Two knots to me is not a big deal, so I'm happy with that, especially when at the cruising speeds, we're basically right on. Now, one thing you can do to cross-check, and ultimately what we did, is fly with another aircraft with a known good static system. So I ended up getting the opportunity at one point to fly in a loose formation with a Cessna 182 that also had a G3X in it. And being a certified airplane, we were pretty confident in the static system of that aircraft. And what we found is that when we were reading about 131, the 182 was showing 130. So as far as I'm concerned, again, we're basically right there. And, uh, and that's plenty close for, for my comfort.